Good morning, everyone. Good morning, brothers and sisters and young people. So as Tony kind of referenced off the top of our service this morning, once again this Sunday, as we meet together to focus our minds on God's word and to remember our risen Lord, we do so while witnessing a huge and important worldwide moment. So similarly to how many of our talks lately have tackled themes and ideas which we're all dealing with due to our isolation from one another and from our friends and families, maybe from our work, and really a change from our normal lives due to the unprecedented global pandemic that's COVID-19. When I was preparing for my exhortation over the last couple of weeks, I found it hard to think about what I was going to talk about without framing it with the reality of what's currently taking place in the world around us. And that's that my social media feeds and what I see in the international news cycle whenever I go online has become inundated with stories and with images and videos and people's opinions centered around black rights and particularly, but not limited to in the United States. And my personal frustrations at the reaction of the world around me to crises like coronavirus or the systemic racism and the police brutality in the US and the rest of the world, they have only served to strengthen my belief that truly our only hope is our Lord's return. And I've been reminded of that constantly by seeing how people react to these things that our world is facing. And it's not just recently, I think it's always been this way, of course, but it's been brought to the forefront of my mind because of a couple things that have taken place. This sense of hopelessness for the world as we know it was first brought dramatically to the forefront for me personally um, recently when a man proven time and again to be morally deplorable throughout his campaign was nevertheless voted into arguably the highest office in the world, primarily by voters who seemed happy to be fed misinformation. And many of these voters would contend to be Christians. And then following that event in 2016, there's been seemingly a rise in misinformation as people who are empowered by having a president who doesn't care about facts or the seemingly the well-being of anyone who won't vote for him anyway. We've seen a surge in, in alternate viewpoints. Uh, and these stretch from small but harmful viewpoints all the way up to things like there's a lot of people contending that the earth is flat. And I hear that way too often that I'm comfortable with. So back in March, more recently, when we were given the simple instruction to limit our interactions with other households, and we're told that that would help save lives in the long run. The backlash that arose from people who seemed to have received completely different information or just refused to accept it was upsetting to me, but it didn't surprise me because this is the way that our world is. And even more problematic and troubling than that is the response to this latest crisis that I've been alluding to and that Tony alluded to. The idea that there are somehow two sides to the argument that police shouldn't be killing unarmed, non-threatening people, and that if they do, there should be immediate and consistent and serious consequences is unfathomable to me, but that is the world that we live in. Some people hear that, that take and react negatively towards it. So both of these issues and many other issues that our societies face, but especially the latter issue, illustrate seemingly irreparable divides in our Western society. And while these are extremely complex issues that I'm not trying to oversimplify at all, a lot of these problems that we face on a grander scale as a society boil down to one main issue, which I think is a lack of empathy. In both of these cases, and as I mentioned with many other contentious issues, the problem at the heart of the matter is the refusal of parties or individuals to give up something that they want or something that they're comfortable with, some part of what they perceive as their right. And they don't wanna give it up regardless of whatever evidence that doing so would be beneficial for other people. These people are unwilling to become slaves as they would see it to the greater good. And instead by protecting their freedom, they've just become slaves to serving themselves instead or to serving others who meet the qualification of sharing their same worldview. 
Let's take a look at Romans chapter 6, and the 20th verse is what we're going to read there. Romans 6 verse 20 says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. The new literal translation phrases it, When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. That's exactly where so many people around us are at. I heard a quote recently from someone talking saying, most people kind of don't care. Most people are very selfish. Most people don't care what happens as long as they get to do their favorite thing. People don't even want to back off from their favorite thing. They don't even want to do their second favorite thing. And of course, it's meant to seem ridiculous when you spell it out like that, but there's a lot of truth to it as well. And that's basically what scripture tells us about the way we'll act if we allow our flesh to rule over us. But if we continue in Romans 6, the letter there continues to tell us that the end of those things, the end of that attitude of being a slave to sin, is death. But keep reading. Romans 6 verse 22, because here's the contrast for us. It says in Romans 6 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves to God, you have your fruits to holiness and the end, everlasting life. Most people don't like that terminology. They don't want to be slaves or servants to anything. What the letter to the Romans is trying to point out is that if we're trying to live a life in Christ, then it's no longer about us, but about serving God just like Christ did. So what does that look like practically? Well, our reading this morning in the Epistle of James gives us a fantastic description of what the life of a believer should look like. James' letter, the whole thing, is full of verses that we can easily call to mind. Verses that are often very simple in their message and their application, but verses that, if I'm being honest, I find very difficult to apply consistently in my own life. So let's take a look at the first thing that he tells the Jewish believers. Um, if you turn to James 1, and we're going to begin reading at verse 2. James 1, verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. This seems like the kind of thing I wouldn't want someone to say to me. Not to say that he's wrong, and we're going to get into why he's not. He's definitely correct. But the reason I say it sounds that way is because it's so much in contrast to how we experience trials and expect those around us to react. Imagine if I'd just been telling Tony about something difficult that was happening in my life, and Tony was like, well, Mike, you should be happy. I'm like, I just finished telling you how upset I was. And Tony said, well, hopefully this makes you more patient. That would probably be the last time that I talked to Tony about my trials. But of course, that's not what James is saying. James is putting the responsibility on each of us as individuals to look at our own trials as something joyful. Hard to do, right? It's something that we each need to work on because what James is describing is not a natural reaction to trial. Our flesh would prefer to lash out, to become depressed by our situation or by what we see happening in the world around us, or maybe give up altogether and drastically change our viewpoints based on what we're experiencing. A lot of these options are appealing because they're sometimes easier, but they're also more self-serving because they make whatever we're going through all about us and our experience with it, rather than recognizing God's hand at work in our lives. Let's take a look at a few verses over in Ecclesiastes. We're told something there about patience that relates really well to what James is talking about here in James 1. Ecclesiastes 7, and we're going to read there beginning at the 8th verse. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 says, The end of a thing is better than the beginning. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Do not say, Why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. A lot of what's happened recently in the world around us has a lot of people echo echoing that sentiment in Ecclesiastes. Why were the former days better than these? 
So the key to accomplishing what James is talking about when he talks about our attitude during trials is the recognition that the end is truly greater than the beginning in the ultimate sense. So scripture and God knows that it's unrealistic to expect that we will manage to always be happy about bad or difficult things that we're going through. But what James is telling us is with a mindset that is focused on what's to come as our ultimate goal, we're able to retain a joyful attitude based on knowledge that our trials are not the end for us. And the importance of that knowledge is what Ecclesiastes talks about next, right after the verse we read. And it's also what James moves on to talking about immediately after the verses that we've been considering so far. So this is when our vision becomes vital. Having a mind that we're trying to train to seek first the kingdom of God and striving for that patience that James talks about to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When that is already our goal as we approach or find ourselves in trials or times of trouble, then is when we're able to continue in joy. Not simply because of the negative circumstances, we're not happy about what's happening, but because we know that those circumstances are actually a stepping stone in God's plan for us. And that if we have the right attitude, we can potentially be made stronger by allowing God to work with us. And James picks up on this and fleshes out this same idea later in this chapter. If you take a look at verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. But the key is having patience with what's happening. And also having wisdom that God has a plan for us. A little further down in James 1 in verse 19, he says, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And we can see that the world around us could definitely use a lot more of that attitude right now. Take a look at how this same principle is summarized for us over in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, we're going to begin reading there at verse 6 and read a section of verses. It says there, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we see some similar words keep popping up in these verses that we've covered so far on our attitude toward trial. Romans 6 called the first century believers to be slaves or servants to God. The passage in the letter to Corinthians that I alluded to instruct us to bring our thoughts into captivity. And the section of verses that we just read in Hebrews tells us that we're to be in subjection to the Father. And as we mentioned off the top, this is much of the problem of the world around us. Nobody wants to be told to do anything. And if they are, it's often met with staunch refusal to educate oneself on whatever thing they're being asked to do. On the contrary, it often becomes worse when many people dig in their heels on whatever they already believed and whatever divide was there becomes even larger as a result. It works the same for us. We're not going to be able to simply decide to follow Christ and God and then do so effectively and continue in it unless we understand who they are and what they've done for us. It requires a commitment and effort on our part in order to achieve. And for this reason, the very next section of verses in James 1 shows us where that wisdom comes from. Let's take a look in James 1, beginning at verse 5. James writes, If any of you lacks wisdom, 
Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let no man, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The world today, more than ever, has an astronomically high number of sources for information, but far less sources than that for actual wisdom. The idea of simple knowledge in the English language is defined as an acquaintance with facts, truths, or principles, as from study or from investigation. To illustrate this, I was going to look up some funny fact um, and memorable thing to share this point. So I Googled when I was preparing random animal facts and the, the result uh, fits in perfectly with what we're talking about because I clicked on the very first link, which was something like top 10 random animal facts. And I scrolled down to one I liked because it was interesting. It was uh, polar bears are all left-handed. But because I never heard that before, before putting in the exhortation, I simply Googled the words polar bears left-handed. And the first result was polar bears are not left-handed. It's a common misconception that polar bears use their left paw to do most things. Research has shown they use both equally. What? I did five seconds of work and now I don't know what to believe about polar bears. But this plays perfectly into what James is talking about because wisdom that we get from God isn't polar bear facts. It isn't trivial knowledge and it isn't the kind of thing that anyone can just put up whatever they want. Wisdom, as he uses it here in this passage, is the Greek word Sophia. And we define it as knowledge of what is true or right, coupled with just judgment as to action. Also, sagacity, discernment, or insight, or the ability to judge what is true, right, or lasting. So these definitions illustrate that the wisdom that James is talking about is far more important than simple knowledge. While knowledge can be useful, for example, having a knowledge of Bible prophecy, there's also a capacity within that definition for all kinds of useless, trivial, or as we learned very quickly on Google, just straight up incorrect information that can fill up our minds and take up so much of our time. Wisdom, on the other hand, is that specific knowledge that is useful and essential in our lives. This is what James is saying comes from our Heavenly Father. How often when we struggle with something is our initial response to try to come up with a solution on our own, only to be frustrated by our own lack of wisdom? Or we can turn to friends or family, but these sources can only truly help us if they're trying to find the answers with a spiritual mindset. So what James stresses to us is the importance of the fact that true wisdom comes from God. And we can gain this wisdom through asking God through prayer and through reading his word. In the second epistle of Peter, we have a great book for looking at knowledge and the type of knowledge that God wants us to have. If you take a quick look through second Peter, you'll see how often this word knowledge comes up. And there are at least four different Greek words for knowledge that are found, um, that I found to be used throughout second Peter. Uh, and they all do have slightly different meanings. So the one that I'd like to focus on is the one that I think relates most closely to the English word wisdom. And that's the Greek word epignosis. This word is defined and its usage is recognition, full discernment, intimate knowledge, the kind of knowledge that changes the way one acts and thinks if they possess it. So this is similar to what James is talking about. This word appears in the first chapter of 2 Peter three times. Let's take a look at those verses. So 2 Peter 1, and let's look at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then again in verse 3, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And then down in verse 8, for if these things are yours and abound, it's talking about um, brotherly kindness and love here, if those things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, flip over to 2 Peter 2, 
and we'll read verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. So every time this particular word for knowledge is used, there's an important action or an imparted attitude that goes along with it. This is that same knowledge or wisdom that one can only receive by asking God. However, what James isn't saying is that whatever we ask of God, he's going to give us, which is made clear in verse 7 back in James 1. Because the verse before that, verse 6, brings out the important condition of having faith. It's only by God's overwhelming grace and through a faithful, sincere request that our prayers may come to fruition. And they still may not in the way that we pray for them. And that's because God knows what's best for us and what situations and experiences will help us far more than we're aware of. James applies this same idea a little later on in his letter. Let's turn back to James and we're going to read in James 5 verses 13 to 16. James 5, beginning at verse 13, says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the ecclesia and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So for us as believers, it's important to understand that we're to ask God specifically for wisdom. And that wisdom will allow us to recognize that everything else, our trials and our blessings, also come from him. Now there is one exception to this, and James is clear on that as well. Let's look uh, back in James 1 at verse 13. James 1, beginning at verse 13, he says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when full grown brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James is careful here to inform the believers where sin comes from, eliminating any notion that temptation comes from God or from some other supernatural source instead of from our own flesh. Likewise, he describes where good gifts actually come from. And again, we see the instruction for a follower of Christ in direct opposition to the thinking of the flesh. It's more natural for us to become puffed up by our own accomplishments and convince ourselves that the blessings we have are our own doing. Just as it's easier for us to blame our failures on external factors or on other people. James is sure to show the believers here that temptation and evil come from within, while blessings come from God. We have to make God and Christ a real part of our day-to-day lives, not just the grand affairs of the world around us. There is an excellent verse for this over in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 in verse 21 says, He, that is God, changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. It's exactly what James is talking about, but... It's in direct relation to his hand over the whole earth. How humbling to remember that the same God who's in control of the entire world, who's guiding the affairs of the nations, who's setting up leaders, also genuinely cares about each one of his children. He controls our trials, and he knows everything that we need in our lives better than we do. The last section in James that we're going to take a look at is the last verse of James chapter 1. This is probably the most well-known verse in this chapter, and it's also one that offers a succinct definition of our service to God in Christ. 
It says in James 1, uh, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I think sometimes we can do really well at the second part. I think we can make sure to do the Bible readings and attend ecclesial functions, to be clear on all the things that we're not supposed to do and make sure that we're not doing them. But the first part can be a lot harder as individuals because traditionally it hasn't been the focus of a lot of what our, exp our experience is as Christadelphians. So of course, it's also important that we don't fall into a trap of routine service to God. It's vital to recognize that serving and strengthening one another on a regular basis is what we're called to do. But it's also important to make sure that we don't allow the things that we do within the ecclesia and on our own time, such as readings and prayers, to become an empty act that we perform without thinking about. Those things need to spurn us to good action towards the most needful. There's a big difference between us doing something naturally because it's become a good habit and doing it robotically because we're, we know we're supposed to. What we're striving for and what James is talking about all through this chapter is to naturally think on God, his commandments, his plan, his message, and to allow that to affect the things we do, things we say, and the things we think about, as opposed to going through the motions of attendance and participation without developing as a servant of God. So what James gives us at the end of it, this first chapter is not service to God in its entirety. I said it because there's no mention of things like baptism and preaching and other specifics that we know are important, but it's a microcosm of the essential, essential aspects of our service to one another as believers and then our service to God. Because the first portion brings out the importance of serving one another especially those who are in times of need. Helping, building each other up, and helping with the blessings we've been given from God, as James just showed them. And the second portion is our service to him, and striving to serve him as best we can. Christ talks about this topic over in John chapter 15, and we're going to read a section of verses beginning at verse 12. John 15, in the 12th verse, Let's start in verse 11 of John 15. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this that, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So this fits in perfectly with what we're talking about with, with having joy and with following God. And it also presents both sides of godly service, serving each other and the idea of giving your life for others and serving God through obeying his commandments, which were given through Christ during his ministry. And also just as James tells us of the blessing received by those who follow God, uh, back in James one, we see that through striving for these things and through the grace of God, Christ says that we have the opportunity to become his friends. Let's continue a little further down in John 15 and starting where we left off in the 15th verse. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So brothers and sisters, by being servants to God's will, we have an opportunity to be Christ's friends. So we need to strive to do the things that James is talking about. Patience through trials. Recognizing that our very lives and the whole world are in God's hands. And because of that, we need to strive after that wisdom which comes from him, from his holy scriptures. And then we need to take actions based around our faith and obedience, which are gained through that wisdom of his will and commandments. And because of that, the outworking in our ministry should be striving to love and serve one another, especially those who need it the most, especially those who are in trouble. And ultimately, this is our service to our Heavenly Father. We have to try to serve him perfectly as Christ did 
because that's what we hope to do eternally in his kingdom. Christ did it perfectly, even to his death on the cross, which we remember this morning through emblems. So just to close our thoughts this morning, we're going to look at a section of verses that we looked at last week in our exhortation in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Thank you.